Hello, everyone, and welcome to Therapists Supporting Therapists. I am Michelle Lundstrom, and today I am here with Dr. Carlos Canales. Welcome. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here. I'm very excited to have you here. Now, Carlos, you are a licensed psychologist, a certified group psychotherapist, a somatic a experiencing practitioner. You've been in private practice since 2011. You have so many amazing credentials. Could you tell us just a little bit about yourself? Well, I, uh, I, <laughs> I have some credentials. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, the, I was thinking about this question and one of the the first things that came to mind, especially as we're going through this pandemic that is global, is the fact that I'm Peruvian. And I was, I was born in South America in the 70s, and a lot of my formation happened there. And when I came to the United States when I was 16 in 93, I didn't know English. And so there is a way in which I look into this culture from the outside and also from within, because now I've lived here for 26 years. Mm -hmm. But I have an angle of, you know, the experience of a minority and even a foreigner looking in. And um, I happen to have gone to a graduate program that was psychodynamic. And I think part of the, the theme of this interview is the conversation about transference and, and counter-transference. And that's, you know, very much uh, the origins of those concepts are psychodynamic in nature. But because I'm Peruvian and communal, uh, you know, I come from a collectivistic culture. Mm -hmm. So even though I went to a psychodynamic school that really tries to pay attention to the intra psyche of a person, that didn't make sense to me. So systems, families, groups made more sense to me. Mm -hmm. And once I started working with people long term, then I fell upon, I needed a theory that could really help me look inside and look into the unconscious in particular, not just people's behaviors, but how people really, you know, what motivates them, what drives them, why they, do they feel that way or they feel um, contradictory things. So I guess my, my uh, credential, my main credential, I think, is coming into this culture and having to kind of built myself again um, and and uh, fall in love with the understanding of people and pain uh, in particular and um, yeah and, and, and just to speak in the psychodynamic language <laughs> beautiful well, thank you so much for that and I, and I love how all of that background ties into what we're going to to talk yeah. about today and you are a wonderful speaker and I actually thought of you for this um, originally because I attended one of your trainings and one of your workshops and you were presenting on transference and counter-transference among many other psychodynamic elements. And I was just wondering for, for those who may be not familiar or may have forgotten and, and not thought about this much since graduate school, can you give us a brief reminder of the role of transference and counter-transference in therapy? Yeah. Um, so it is, so common that when a client comes in, they come in with need to the, to, the, to the therapy room, and then they begin projecting stuff into the therapist. They might know it all, they might be super help, or they don't want to give me anything. They're too quiet, whatever it is. So transference is the activation of pre-existing expectations, templates, scripts, ways of feeling into the therapist, into the work. And it happens involuntarily. Some people say we're always transferring because we're always making associations about the present from what we know before. So it could be a displacement of an unresolved conflict, of a dream, of a desire, you know, and it, it's just always happening. And it's happening for the therapist as well. You know, as soon as we see the client, we begin to have some resonance. Do I know this kind of sadness? Do I know this anxiety? You know, and, I, and, and we're having to constantly pull people to reality because we can easily form reality due to our past. The stronger the transference, the more the rigidity in personalities, the more difficult the change sometimes. 
but we really want to get to, especially in psychodynamic treatment, you know, they, they say pay attention to resistance, but pay attention to transference. That's your strongest vehicle. You know, the relationship with the client is the most important therapeutic factor. Find out the quality of your relationship. Yes. Beautiful. And yeah, it shows us so much. Right. Yeah. Right. And I would like to say, there is many, many people who don't practice paying attention to the transference. Mm -hmm. What does the client think about me? Why now? Mm -hmm. What do they want to get out of me? How are they tricking me into either being helpful or being uh, other things? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, so and same for us. Absolutely. So I, I think some therapists have noticed that this experience of switching to telehealth and them getting more of a glimpse into our lives has um, been making this a little bit more obvious or more prevalent. And so um, as I've been hearing from people, um, they, I think it would be helpful to talk about managing transference and counter-transference while working from home. I mean, can you walk us, us through some ways to work with that transference if a client yeah. having a reaction to our environment? Yeah, well, traditionally, we control the setting. We set up our offices, you know, some therapists put pictures mm -hmm. of nature, or uh, sometimes people put a picture of their family, mm -hmm. and we have control or more control of what we disclose to every client. Mm -hmm. And because of telehealth, we're actually showing different environments. And now there is a possibility in Zoom that you could create a background and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and just consistently not reveal as much. The interesting thing is that our clients are curious about us. To a degree. Oh, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> now in space. Yeah. Uh, uh, our clients are curious about us. They become less curious when their pain is contained. Mm -hmm. If they, their pain is, less con is, is more contained, they think of us as mom, and then the relationship is more fluid. Mm -hmm. When I started practicing, in, uh, I saw my first client, I think, 1998. And uh, a lot of people would ask me, where are you from? Mm -hmm. And I think it's because I was uncomfortable holding the patient. Right? It was new, I was young, I was in my early 20s. Mm -hmm. What am I doing here? Like I had more questions about me than I think that I would offer to the client, you know, in terms of life experience or whatever. And now nobody asks me that. Mm -hmm. Like it's, I, I think it's uh, something to be um, kind of curious about is, is why I haven't changed necessarily, or perhaps I have, perhaps mm -hmm. clients have also uh, in terms of uh, cultural exposure. But I think the main thing is how I hold people in the office. And so they don't need to ask because somehow I made it homey. Now, as people look into your background, suppose so blue, they get to learn something about your personality, mm -hmm. you know? And there is something, um, it, at least this is my transference, exciting, you know? What are blue things? The ocean, the sky, expansive, happy. <laughs> it's not cloudy, it's blue skies, <laughs> yeah. right? But, but it could also be the blues. Mm-hmm. There can, there can also be a sadness. Now, I am using too much symbol, but that's what psychodynamic people do. Mm -hmm. What we care about is we want to, like in anything else, we want to explore, hey, take a look. Here I am. Find me in the equation. And then you go, and what's it like to see me here? Some clients may comment, oh, you know, you have a bookshelf in the back or you have... Right? Some people may say, well, I miss your office. Yeah. Well, tell me about it. Right? I think it's so important to begin to say, what associations did you have about where I would practice? I also work with uh, several therapists and uh, you know, many clients who are, this is my office. This is my home office, they say. And it's just so bare. Mm -hmm. or it's, or it's just, then you realize, why, if you work here for eight hours a day, why didn't you add a plant? 
What do you, right? Why don't I think we get insight into how people take care of themselves or not? But same for the therapist. Mm-hmm. Some therapists place themselves in a corner with very little light. Uh, you know, again, I don't want to be so disclosing. You're not supposed to know so much about me. Uh-huh. And and uh, but but I think uh, what is being shared also is um, again that I don't want to be so revealing. I don't want to disturb the work. I don't think it disturbs the work. It might be talked about for a minute or two, and then the client gets satisfied and then move moves on. So. Pay attention to what the psyche is doing in yourself and in others and, and be curious, go after it. And uh, what I care most about more than the setting is the presence. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's clients might be able to see, you know, my goodness, look at these beautiful windows that my therapist, my therapist lives in a great house, I pay for it. Or <laughs> whatever, right? <laughs> But what I care about is this, is this business of, is the client feeling held? Mm-hmm. Right? Or is the client preoccupied or, you know, in my therapist doesn't live well, doesn't look comfortable in their chair. My therapist uh, lives too well, right? It's mm-hmm. less about my presence and how I'm holding the client and responding to their need. So I would pay attention to, because setting is one important aspect, is the structural aspect, yeah. but I care about more so the process aspect, is, is the person feeling cared for and held. You know? Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and as I experience you, and, I, and I've experienced you in the past, I feel like you're very good at that, of, of holding that container and holding that space. Thank for- you that that bubble regardless yeah. of the setting yeah so so one of those techniques you know that that would pursue presence uh, michelle is like so suppose you you were my client i might say michelle it, it sounds as you are able to find me even though we are probably miles apart in this moment mm-hmm. that, that even though we're not looking at each other's eyes you know because there is the camera and mm-hmm. it, it's not direct eye contact yeah. that we really feel each other with our hearts. Is that right? We're finding each other even at a distance. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's, that, th- those kinds of comments uh, seek out presence. No, oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah, and, and I could feel the heart connection as you were, as you were doing that. Yeah. I just, like, wanted to smile. It felt yeah. good. Yeah. yeah, and I felt it too. This is mm-hmm. why I use, is, is using myself to make a link with you and help us both be alive in this time of disconnection. Yeah. Because I need you just as much as you might need me. Right. What a beautiful example of a way to connect over telehealth in that that very heart-centered, I care about you, I'm holding space for you way. Yeah, yeah, right. We're creating a psychic space, a psychological space where we're both in it. This safe, containing, room Mm -hmm. or maybe square (laughs) (laughs) squares rectangles right right all right so shifting gears a little bit i'm wondering if you could talk then the other way when um our clients or when we're having a a reaction to our clients in this way it's like counter transference just as we as you shared um so I think all of us are having experiences of this. Um, just yesterday, I was meeting w- with somebody, and she's like, "Oh, there's nobody in my house. I think we'll just live in the meet in the living room." And I look, and it, and it was just this kind of church style, or like very tall ceilings, wonderful windows, greenery outside. I was like, "That is just stunning," and it's all woodwork. Like it's just stunning, and yeah. and I've always uh, seen this uh, particular client. Uh, in sweatpants it's like it just doesn't match all the woodwork right so i have an opportunity to comment and say hey you uh inadvertently are showing me a little bit more about this place where you live mm-hmm. i want to tell you it's quite beautiful 
Yeah. What role did you take in creating this space? Mm -hmm. And uh, so it turns out that you are you have quite an artistic and a design eye. Now tell me, when you pay attention to you, does that carry over? Mm -hmm. Right? Is it, is it for home? Is it for others? What you wanted to give your family? Does that carry over? It gives us opportunities to talk. Yeah. I, I have seen, um, uh, so I do group therapy, and I have a group that has uh, four or five Latinas in it. Mm -hmm. To my surprise, two, if not three, but one of them was able to get a computer, two of the Latinas didn't have a computer. Mm -hmm. And so they use their phone, and that's a disadvantage yeah. when using group therapy because they cannot see everybody present. Mm -hmm. And I begin to see some of the inequalities. One didn't have um, uh, internet in their home, mm -hmm. so they had to go to school to borrow the Wi-Fi to be in session, yeah. right? And and just park their car and do this. So again, these are things that we have now an opportunity before. We, we didn't get to see the inequality um, mm -hmm. of, of economic status. Yeah. And now we get to process it with group. We get to see more who is not working and who is overworking, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and those who are not working have an anxiety about survival. Right? Yeah. And so I would say always, if you see it, use it clinically be able to talk about it, put it in words, catch your own impulse. It doesn't have to be right away. Yeah. You know, catch your and then reflect about it. Right? Uh, so that but use it clinically because it's now part of the clinical arena. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. That's a beautiful example of how this is kind of showing up for you. Do you have any other yeah. examples that you would like to share with us of ways that maybe you're seeing common transference, counter-transference with telehealth? Well, yeah, uh, certainly. Um, I, I think all of us, are, from my perspective, we're, we're living a kind of physiological and sociological attack. Mm -hmm. Who is going to get this darn virus? Is there somebody, I mean, I went to a conference in New York late February, early March, and they were talking about, okay, you know, there is this virus coming, don't shake hands, you know, just, you know, touch elbows. But it was kind of playful. Yeah. About a week and a half earlier, 32 people from the, con from the conference uh, came out, tested positive. Mm. And that I know one person died. Wow. Now, I knew several of these people. Mm -hmm. And I had a different kind of worry, right? Uh, so, it'd be, so I feel as though something is attacking our society, our way of living, it's taking away jobs, it's taking away meat. You know, in the past week, we just heard about that. Taking away resources. So all of us have nervous systems that are activated. Mm -hmm. And we are taking it one way or another. You know, how do we deal with attack? You know, but I think it is not um, difficult to bump into, oh, you're not working? While I'm working, there are feelings about that. Yeah. That could be talked about. Or, thank goodness we're both working. Mm -hmm. But then there can also be a survival guilt. Mm -hmm. Because we know many people who aren't. Yeah. Right? And, and the different stressors that may show. I, I think the severity of people's um, uh, managing this anxiety is growing higher. You know, we, we see that the loners are, sometimes they can go, now everybody knows what I live with. Yeah. And I am now more alone myself. Well, that's playing out. And um, for us, we have a job. We're also kind of first responders. And we're fatigued about reading stuff in the news. Mm -hmm. We're fatigued about some weeks hearing a lot of the same story. When is this going to end? If you have kids, how fatiguing is it to take care of your kids? Yeah. Right? The entire time or 
come up with a school program or I mean it we're living a high demand time and we may be tired of dealing with it ourselves you know talk about kind of transference it's like I you know how can I trim this super fast you know like <laughs> haven't we complained enough I mean is, is there anything else that is relevant in your life it, is we can grow impatient mm -hmm. so I, I think uh, as therapists we really have a duty to be in therapy ourselves you know because a lot is being asked of us you know we, we didn't sign up many of us most of us to do therapy via the computer Mm -hmm. And to get fatigued eyes, I know you had a program about somebody who gave recommendations for their eyes. Thank yeah. goodness, right? I ended up buying um, a film to protect me from blue light because I could feel burn after seven hours of screen time. Yeah, right? that's a lot of time, but you know that's I'm trying to like be as resourceful and helpful to my clients as possible. And then I realized. I, I can't, like my capacity to see people in person is much greater than my capacity to see people on the screen. Yeah. And so, and so then I had to trim people out and that was a hard decision. So I think we're always, uh, we, since, especially since we're living a common experience, there is many possibilities for us to be triggered or for them to be triggered with our own realities, you mm -hmm. know? We as therapists, are we canceling more? Are we having to scramble our schedule? Because, you know, we have also kids at home or, yeah. you know, not this space. Uh, I think uh, most people are understanding, but it doesn't get to be talked about what's it like to see me like this, mm -hmm. right? And, and so I really invite more conversation as to like, and how about now? And a week later, and how about now? Because yeah. we're trying to air out all the impressions, feelings, expectations, hopes. We want to hear what do people want, mm -hmm. you know? And now the big discussion is, I have some clients who say, I'm ready to come back to the office. I'm sick of this. Yeah. And that adds pressure in us. Are mm -hmm. we going to protect them? Are we going to protect the next client? Are we going to gratify? It's tricky. Mm -hmm. You know, it's and these are... Yeah. And these are individual decisions that we're making, and they all have to do with um, transference and current transference, self-care versus care of others. And I think therapists often lose themselves in the care of others. Absolutely. So, so with that, that kind of ties into something I wanted to ask you today about as we start to see things open back up in the United States, what do you see as potential challenges for mental health providers as we return to our offices and, and try and begin to find a new normal? Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, one of the things that is clear to me is like, like government is to be, supposed to be big papa, right? <laughs> Taking care of us medically, you know, they take our taxes to, and yeah. the, nobody has the answer mm -hmm. for, for the virus. So government doesn't have it. The medical community doesn't have it. We run out of resources, ventilators, whatever it might be, meat, whatever it might be. We're running out of resources. We see unemployment. Peru is a country that has 32 million people. And since Corona came out, 32 million people have turn their applications for unemployment. Mm -hmm. I just read an article this morning in the New York Times that said what that means. You know, before, schools used to feed the kids, you know, lunch primarily. And it says for the poor, now we're seeing that kids up to 17% are going hungry. Mm -hmm. That's devastating. Absolutely. Because the, the numbers is, uh, and the impact it's three times the experience that the United States had during the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. So as I anticipate, I think some therapists might be eager to also meet their clients and see them and also feel the social, I mean, fill up with the social needs that we have with one another. And some, some may be like, gosh, I have this duty to, to protect m more than just one and not go for gratification. 
So I may have to stay telehealth for as long as insurances allow me to, right? That, that, so I, I expect, you know, more anxiety, more sadness, mm -hmm. more demand. I, I, I expect um, that we're just kind of, we're getting these waves of Corona passing, but I don't know if we felt yet the, I don't know, we're at 70,000 losses or so in the United States, 73, I think this morning. I don't think we have felt the grief because we're still in the anxiety of what's happening, mm -hmm. right? So I, th I think we're going to hopefully lean towards the feeling of this big, big change in our lives. I mean, what a different spring. Two months ago, three months ago, we would have never imagined this. Right, absolutely. Right? Yeah. And, and then one more thing I would say is like, there is such separations. Like in my own life, my family, uh, or a lot of my family is in Peru, and they have no travel. There's mm -hmm. no planes for like four months, for yeah. four weeks. And I don't know when I'm gonna see them again. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's a really strange time. Before it, travel is like I could be there in a day, and now we don't know. It's a very different way to experience life. You know? Yeah, and every country is is so different. I know I was talking to a friend in France, and <laughs> they have to get permission just to walk their dog, and yes, I mean, just to go outside and do that. And so. It, we have so much freedom in this country that we don't even recognize even through this as we're in, I think you put it well, we're in the, we're in the shock. We're not feeling this yet, but as we're sitting in that shock, it is important to realize and look outside and say, you know what? We have a lot more freedoms than we realize, even though we're feeling very restricted. Yeah. And also because of that freedom, uh, our numbers are so high. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, I mean, we are, a fourth of the world in yeah, terms of cases sword. yeah right yeah. absolutely so i'm curious as we talk about this what have you learned about yourself in this mm. process being a healer and also balancing being a human being impacted by a pandemic well it's really a good question uh i i think i've learned to notice how similar I am to everyone else, mm -hmm. how scared I can get, how much I need social connection, touch, words of affirmation, you know, um, how much I want that for my kids. I mean, my kids haven't played with other kids for six weeks. That's strange. Mm -hmm. For kids but also but also for me yeah so i i think um we're really called upon uh, many people said well you know it's great more family time well for many families that's great mm -hmm. for many other families that isn't great yeah right and um and, and how much we depended on a village mm -hmm. schools you know everything else to work together to collaborate now we don't have the village. I think it's really stressful. So, so I, I think I'm learning to slow down, live simpler. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would even highlight work a little less. Mm -hmm. I've, I've enjoyed the spring in a way that I didn't enjoy the spring for the past six years here in Iowa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and because I'm trying to soak up on those birds singing, mm -hmm. on the green coming out. Now I have a little more time to notice. Yeah. Not just play Monopoly 40 times with my oldest. <laughs> <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> Which I'm also soaking up. Yes. But, but, but I, I, I can say that I'm not missing out so much in their growth. Before I, I had the thought, I work a lot, and, uh, and I give them all my time, but now I really feel much more involved in their lives. So uh, at a personal level, I, I miss uh, professional community more than ever. Yeah. And then coming from California, I used to mingle with about 40 therapists uh, every month for different consultation groups, reading groups, 
uh, conference. I mean, you would just see so many of uh, the same people. And, yeah. and I think in Iowa, in the Midwest, we, we practice too separate, too disconnected. And so I would encourage people to deal with their current transference, go to therapy, find a support group, uh, go seek consultation, talk about your experience. You know, it's a, it's, I think that's the best we can do. Yeah, that's so important. Yeah, we all, we all need each other. We all need our tribe. And yeah. you know, in America, we are a very individualistic society. And I think what this has highlighted is that need for community and where we do have community and connection and tribe. And when that's pulled away from us, we realize just how much we desire that and want that as human beings. And it's good for that's us. Right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, it's very good for us. And I think that is the humanity of, I think, as therapists, we've, we're disclosing that more and more. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's good for us. Yeah. Absolutely. So many therapists have not historically done telehealth at, or worked seeing clients wearing a mask. And that transition can be, as we've talked about, really stressful. So before we wrap up today, do you have any additional words of wisdom that you'd like to share with this community? Well, therapy is about at least two people coming together to have the most personable experience, even deeply personable. What do you feel? What are you ashamed about? What broke you? What traumas happened? Mm -hmm. And the idea of wearing a mask, yeah. right, changes things. Mm -hmm. You know, that's something to the process. We may understand it, but I think um, we can use, if we have to wear one, right? Which I think we will have to wear one. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to talk about how we always have a mask and not make it the exception. Yeah. yeah? That's powerful, Carlos. Yeah. Right? Now, many people haven't used telehealth. Now it's the mainstream. Mm -hmm. I think there is uh, various programs in, in terms of how to, as I was speaking before about heightened presence, you know, because it's not as if we cannot meet and feel one another, right? Mm -hmm. Find a presence, right? If I go like, hey, can you touch? <laughs> right? And now feel your body as you make contact. Right? What we're trying to like heighten is this sense of connection, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important that we do that way more because it's not a giving. That people may relate to you as if they were, you know, supposed to speaking on the phone or watching a movie because mm -hmm. now you're two-dimensional. And so I think we really want to invest in creating that third dimension being intrapsychic connection or bodily connection mm -hmm. and interpersonal connection yeah you know? and then meaning channels i think it's so important to say what does it mean even that we're doing this program because mm -hmm. it contributes hopefully it's going to contribute to somebody in the community but it's already contributed to me i felt special i felt well thank you michelle for thinking of me mm -hmm. i get to see you right i mean we both yeah. feel happier Yes. with the fact of giving. And I was very happy that you said yes. Yeah. So, yes, it made me happier too. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, it's, um, so, so it's important to highlight the meaning, what we're doing matters. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Well, what a beautiful note to end on. I just want to thank yeah. you so much for being a part of this and yeah. for all of the wisdom that you shared with us today. Wonderful. Well, I am excited to, uh, to, to be part of this online community as well and the group you're forming and, uh, and to contribute in whatever way we can to get through this. All right. Thank you yeah. so much, Carlos. Very good. All right. This is bye -bye the for now. Supporting Therapist. I am Michelle Lundstrom. This is Dr. Carlos Canales, and we hope you have a wonderful day. Please like and subscribe. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.